Hi everybody, let me introduce myself. I am Marta Mama, I'm your basic queer bitch. Uh, I'm from Spain, but I grew up in the States, so I'm kind of fluent in English. And I think I've got like a good perspective on Drag Race Spain since I live here, I am a Spaniard, but I also speak English. And I've been watching all the reviews and there's a lot of things that people don't get because of the translation. So let me explain them to you, okay? We've been waiting for this season for the longest time. It felt like forever. <laughs> and we're very excited here in Spain. Not all the queer community is like super pro drag race because it's like kind of mainstream and very like overproduced. But uh, a lot of us basic queer bitches uh, are super big drag race fans. I watch every single season, all the international spin-offs several times. So I am so excited for this season. So let's start with the queens in the workroom. And I'm going to explain all the things that you didn't get um, with the translation and some of the misunderstandings that there are. So the first girl in the workroom was Arancha Castilla La Mancha. No one can pronounce her name, but it's a wordplay with Hannah Montana. She says she's the Spanish Hannah Montana. And that's because of her name and her style, obviously. But her name is Arancha, which is a kind of popular name in Spain, and Castilla La Mancha, which is a region in Spain. So it's just like Hannah Montana, Arancha Castilla La Mancha. So that's something a lot of people don't get. And she comes into the workroom looking like this. Not the cutest, but you know, her style. You're not gonna be judged by your entrance look. So I think this is cute because mm, the only thing you need with your entrance look is for people to know you. So yeah, okay, Arancha, okay, okay, no problem. Uh, next up in the workroom is it Sagitaria, Sagitaria. Uh, her name, Yes, is inspired in Aquaria. She said it multiple times. And Sagittaria is looking so good, so cute, so fine with her nipples out and her little tattoo over here. Isn't she like the cutest thing? She looks a lot like Aquaria though. Like I have no problem about it, you know, like it's drag or whatever. But she does look a lot like Aquaria, which is Good, you know, because Aquarius fierce. And then we have Ugaceo Crujiente. That's another difficult name for you guys. I truly understand. But let me tell you the tea about this name, okay? So, you know, in SpongeBob SquarePants, they have the Krusty Krab, the hamburger place where SpongeBob works. So the translation for that in Spain is Crustaceo Crujiente, okay? So Ugo is a popular name in Spain and the only thing they did is like they put Hugo in the name Crustaceo Crujiente and they made it into Ugaceo Crujiente. It would be similar to maybe, I don't know, if it's called Krusty Crab, I don't know, like maybe Krusty Carl or something like that. You know, it's a wordplay. And she says when she comes out, Estoy hecha un cuadro. And the translation is not very good in English. Uh, cuadro means being a hot mess, and that's the translation that they gave for that in English. But uh, cuadro means like I look like a painting, and she comes out with a frame. She's very big on art and artsy stuff. She is like the coolest queen ever. She's from Barcelona, and uh, yeah, she looks very, very nice. But you know, the translation like I'm a hot mess. Well, yeah, but in Spanish, that means like. I look like a painting or something like that, you know? So that's a little pun that many people weren't getting. And then we get Carmen Farala. Carmen Farala is the fishiest bitch ever. <laughs> and she looks all orange with all the bronzer she has on her body. She comes in like this Versace look that she made. And she's like, this is a Versace. Well, I made it, but... I wear it like if it was Versace, I, you know, I feel my oats in it. It's like a very Giagon fishy kind of queen, but this one is crafty. This one knows what, what they're doing and they're, they're very shady, but not like as much as Giagon, I guess. 
and she is part from a trio, Las Hermanas Farala, the Farala Sisters, and she's just one of them. That's why when she comes in the workroom, she says like, I've battled many blah, 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 but this war I'm going to win all by myself or whatever. I don't know what the translation in English was, girl. But that was why, because uh, she's part of a trio and she is very known for that, like well known for that. And she looks like stunning, doesn't she? Like, she's just stunning. And then we get Poopy Poison. I am so excited to see this queen here. She's a very, very well known and respected artist in Spain because she had like this song, which is was like the nastiest song ever, which is called like Puton Verbenero, which is like, a, like a, a, it's not possible to translate that song, but I'm gonna leave it down below in the comments so you can just check it out. And it's kind of a very popular query song that was popular and it was made by a drag queen, which we're not used to it. So mm, <laughs> we love her so much. Love, love, love her. And she is a comedy queen. She is very into like absurd comedy. And when she comes in, she like says this, like I'm very like absurd. And she makes like this little rhyme, not translatable. <laughs> But we're very excited for her because she's very well known. And they've said they've said that a couple of times in the episode, I think. How um, brave she is for coming into Drag Race, having such a huge career. And uh, she is because she is not going to be the polished queen that everyone wants her to be. She's not. That's not who she is. That's not why we love her here. She is very funny, very absurd. She is like a legend for many of these queens that are in the workroom with her. And I even think, I, uh, before everything was announced, before we knew who the host was, um, they were talking about like a couple people and Booby Poison was in like maybe the predictions for being a host. So that can let you know how well known this queen is in Spain and how much we love, love, love her. So if you see like, oh, she's not Polish, she should have been in the bottom two or whatever, just like, girl, we don't care. She is like the best. We love her. Is this the most like objective thing? And like, mm, no, it doesn't have to be. Girl, this is drag. If she's serving it, she's serving it. She can be wearing like giant turd in her head and we wouldn't care. And, but she comes in in this outfit being all stupid. And that's what we love about her. She doesn't look bad, but this doesn't tell us much about her other than like she's absurd and she's not going to be super polished or fishy because that's not her gig. That's not her gig, you know? And next we have Killer Queen and she is looking stunning. She's doing like this homage to all the medical professionals in the world after the pandemic. She's looking like a pandemic superhero and I'm living for it. She is a doctor out of drag. Interesting. So even if she doesn't win, you know, she got coin. She's known in social media because she had a uh, like, channel with other drag queens like Ariel Reg and other drag queens. Like, I'm gonna put the links down below so you can check it out if you want to. Uh, but yeah, she was known in social media uh, because she like talked about like drag and drag race and drag related stuff. So we kind of know her for that. And then we have Dovima Nurmi with, and she comes out like a villain. She loves like this Disney villain vibe. And we know she got beef with Sagittaria. They were roommates many years ago and they stopped talking to each other. Uh, we're not gonna know the tea for now. They are being so smart, so smart, not like spilling the tea right now because we wanna know and we wanna like stay interested in this thing. I'm sure it's nothing. And all of this is like so overproduced. I'm 100% sure. But, well, it's okay. We're, we're here for it. We like sometimes, like, overproduce good shit. It's okay for me, okay? Then we have Inti. Inti is from Bolivia, and she lives in uh, Belgica, I think. I think so, yeah. She doesn't live in Spain, and she's not from Spain, but she grew up here. 
and she has a like, Spanish accent, even not so much of Bolivian accent. Inti is a ballroom queen, and I am living for ballroom queens. I think it is so important to have like a ballroom representation, but ballroom here is the tea. It is the thing. It is so cool. And they are all like so diverse. It's so inclusive. You know that one of the problems we've got with uh, RuPaul's Drag Race is the problem of trans, trans inclusivity. How it's the problem with like how trans inclusive they are because they're not like they will. Well, now we've got got Mick, but with female presenting trans people, they only get in Drag Race if it's an all stars, like if we've known them since they were mask presenting or whatever, because if not, it's like, they're like, oh, it's so much easier for like femme presenting trans people to win because they already look like a woman or what. It's just like bullshit and nonsense since we have so many, so many queens that are very, very much into like plastic surgery, like detox, or Trinity the Tuck, that's never a problem, but you know, that's something that we need to get a little bit better. No tea, no shade. And she comes in looking gorgeous. She comes in with a uh, little purse and it has like the intersex genitals. And I think that's so cool. This queen has a lot to say. And I think that's so cool because honey, from the LGBTQI plus whatever, we never talk about intersex people. We don't. It's just like, we don't. People didn't even get this in Spanish, but when Inti comes out, she says, oh, I think your dad forgot this last night at my place. And she throws out <laughs> these boxers with the Spanish flag in them. Like she was screwing your dad or whatever. <laughs> I think that was so cute and so nice. And a lot of people, you're, you guys don't understand, this is a very important thing about Drag Race Spain. You're not going to see the Spanish flag in a lot of places because just, it's kind of like, imagine that the American flag was still the Confederate flag, okay? So there's a huge political thing where uh, the Spanish flag is like this symbol for the right-wing people and all the very conservative people because of the civil war that we had we had in Spain there were two flags so it's it's kind of it's you're not going to see the spanish flag in RuPaul's drag race Spain very much because of it and i think it was so cute that the boxers that she threw away were the like with the spanish flag they are a non-binary queen my pronouns are going to be all over the place because uh, i'm going to talk about them in with like she, her pronouns, and with uh, they, them pronouns, uh, because of the drag thing. I don't think she cares. They care. Um, she's very cool. She's a very cool gal, and I love her very much. She looks like a supermodel, doesn't she? I love her. And Inti is in, an indigenous person, and she says that her style is indigenous futuristic, and that is the style that indigenous people will have if they were alive still. Uh, because uh, no, they're not. Yes, there are indigenous people, but the indigenous culture was massacred. And here in Spain, particularly, because we are the people that massacred them, uh, I think it's a very important conversation to have. Then we have Drag Vulcano. Okay, so from the drag tradition in Spain, we have a very, very big tradition in the Canary Islands. The Canary Islands are kind of like far away. They're next to Africa, actually. And over there, that's part of Spain, but over there they have their own drag tradition during Carnaval. Like they have this Mardi Gras. It's a very difficult to explain because it would be kind of like this huge drag pageant. Mix that with like Pride and mix that with like Mardi Gras. And that's the, that's the drag they have in the Canary Islands. So it's a very unique perspective and look. And you can see it right here. She's going to look very similar to this. 
all the time and she comes in with this huge platform boots that everyone is like so shook about and those are the typ the typical footwear that they would use in the Canary Island drag and if you haven't seen any of the Canary Island drag I'm gonna leave like a couple of videos down below because she is very well known in the Canary Islands she has won that pageant and uh, everyone loves her <laughs> she's very unique so if you see like she looks like a bit weird what's going on with her aesthetics it's because of that she's representing the drag that it they have in the Canary Island, which is very, very different and unique and is so very cool. And I'm very, very, very into it. And she's so tall with those shoes. She gets all the numbers wrong, but girl, we love you. We love you. There's no problem. You can be bad at math if you look that good. <laughs> and the last one in the workroom is the Macarena. Um, the Macarena looks like this. She is giving us like Sailor Moon meets Flamenco dress. This is a queen that is from the south of Spain. And Spain is a very diverse country, actually, but everything you kind of know from the traditions in Spain, like the flamenco dress and the flamenco music and the sun and beaches and everything and like people riding horses and all the traditional stuff comes from the south of Spain. It's very difficult to explain how regional dresses work in Europe in general and in Spain in particular, but each region of Spain have their own regional traditional dresses that they've been wearing for different occasions like traditional uh, holidays uh, and traditional parties and traditional things. And the flamenco dress is only like in the south of Spain. So most of the things and like flamenco songs and everything, all that comes from the south of Spain. So what she's giving us is Sailor Moon meets flamenco dress. She's wearing a peineta, which is the thing that she has in her head, which is very traditional from the flamenco dress. And flamenco dresses are very interesting in the fashion world because they're the only traditional regional fashion that goes, like, changes every single year and is part of the, like, fashion world because they, they, stay, they stay updated. They have, like, different trends and fashions and they change and it's very traditional. I live in the south of Spain, too. Here, a lot of women here in the south of Spain get one of these dresses made every single year so they can wear them in all these traditional events that we have around here in Andalusia. So I love that she's like very uh, Andaluza and very flamenco, but very like Sailor Moon and anime girl too. And she speaks fluent English and I'm living for it. You don't know what you... I think you can't understand 100% about Macarena is her personality because here in the south of Spain people have a very unique sense of humor and they're very natural and they're very open and they're very and they're very funny they are so funny they identify also as non-binary just at like uh, Arancha Castilla-La Mancha, Ugacio Crujiente, Inti and them they all identify as non-binary. And I think they had like a very interesting conversation in the workroom because people don't generally assume that they are non-binary because they look masculine. And I understand that struggle 100% girl. Uh, you are you, you do you. You don't owe anyone your femininity. You don't have to like be more femme or non-binary presenting for nobody. Like they don't have to perceive you as non-binary for you to be non-binary. So I understand that struggle. I love the conversation. I love that we have four non-binary people in the work. I just would love that they have more trans femme presenting people in the workroom and they like end all this bullshit. Ah. <laughs> then we have the mini challenge. The mini challenge is so funny. Um, they have this mechanical bull and things that you may not get is that uh, the bulls, the bullfighting and like running in front of the bulls, that's very traditional in Spain. But most of the people in Spain and especially most queer people, most like most decent people 
are against it. I don't know if you guys understand that in bullfighting, they just kill a bull with a sword in front of thousands of people. And it, it's terrible. So it's a cool way to like try to incorporate the bull and the bullfighting, but from a like cuter, cuter perspective. But you know, bullfighting is very, very problematic and it's a very, very hot topic here in Spain. So um, yeah, they did that. It was so funny. Carmen won. We laughed a lot. I love when the first episode starts with photo shoots. That's something that they used to do that they don't do that often. And people used to love them because you can get to see like their personality. I think it was great when they did it in Drag Race Canada with Jimbo screaming or whatever. So the photo shoots in like impossible situations, I think are the best way to start a season because you get to know them a little bit better. The commentary is going to be a lot better than in the balls and we've got time to see all the runways and stuff. Then we've got the main challenge. The main challenge is to drag in a dime, basically, okay? So um, Carmen Farala won the mini challenge so she could select her boxes, her box of material. And uh, then they all like get their things and they start panicking. Dovima Nurmi starts panicking. I don't know how much. I uh, Seeing Sagittaria there threw her off. Um, I don't know. It think, I think it's not about Sagittarius at all. It's just her being insecure and like, what the fuck am I doing here? Like not feeling deserving to be here or whatever. But like, girl, come on. No one wants to see that. Like, fake it till you make it. If you think you're not deserving to be there, just fake it and you will be deserving to be there. I don't know. But yeah, they struggle a bit. Killer Queen is killing it. And she started sewing right away. Everyone was so intimidated. I'm living for it. And then the runway. Okay, so let me explain a little bit about the main judges that we have. Of course, we have Supreme Deluxe, which is the host. Can we talk about how amazing Supreme Deluxe is? I think she's such a great host. I think no one was expecting this, like at all. Uh, she was not the main name to be the host of RuPaul's Drag Race. It was probably La Prohibida, which is another very famous drag queen in Spain. And we were all expecting maybe La Prohibida or another one. She was, you know, in the predictions, maybe, whatever. But no one was expecting her to be so amazing at hosting something because she's kind of sweet, but funny. She's very punny, just like RuPaul. And I just... I think she's doing such an amazing job and we're so very proud of her. Then we have Ana Locking. She's not very well known in Spain, but she's an amazing, amazing designer. And she designs clothes, like very draggy clothes. And she just won this important fashion award in Spain in 2020. The critiques she gave were so on point. So on point. I think she's great to be in the panel of judges. And then we have Los Javis the Javis that are Javi, Javier Ambrosi and Javier Calvo. And these two guys are the directors, the showrunners for La Veneno. La Veneno is a TV series, it's a TV show created by the same platform. And it's about Cristina Ortiz La Veneno, which is a very important trans person who was very, very well known in Spain in the 90s. And I grew up watching her and I love her so much. And this TV show is the most amazing TV show that I have ever seen. <laughs> I just love how they tell this story. And I think it's being such a big hit internationally and being from the same platform and being about, about like a trans person, of course they had to have them on the panel. Like everyone knew Los Javis were going to be in this panel of judges. It was no surprise whatsoever. I think they're cool. I don't, I think they may not, I think they're Drag Race fans and people were saying like, oh, they're like so like mainstream or whatever, or they wanted to see like more good drag representation in the panel of judges, but I think they're good there. We have to think that this platform start getting kind of big because of La Veneno was the biggest thing they had on the platform of, 
a lot of people got to subscribe to that platform to watch Love and Eno. And it's now that you have all these queer people subscribed to your platform, then they started doing drag race. So of course they were gonna they were gonna have them in the panel of judges. And I cannot say enough. I cannot say this enough. If you haven't watched Love and Eno, please stop whatever you're doing. Stop all your drag race on unders and sh things and go watch Love and Eno. You have it internationally in HBO Max, and I think it is just amazing. The trans representation in the TV show, both in front of the cameras and behind the cameras, is it's just huge. They have a huge trans representation in Love and Eno, and I really think you should watch. Okay, and then we have the special guest, which is John Cortajarena. And this is very, very problematic. He is a famous model in Spain. He's the hot dude. I don't like him personally. He had a couple of years ago, he had he was talking in, in an interview and he was saying how he does not like when men wear makeup, that he think men wearing makeup is the worst thing ever. And, you know, messy messy things to say if you're going to be over here like get it together bring another judge I don't think that he is deserving I don't think he knows anything about drag I don't like anything he has to say so I'm not very interested in him his voice like he thinks he's Batman or something I just don't I'm not girl bye but well sorry sorry for the shade he's cute he's cute okay he's cute Okay, the runways. Okay, so for the runway, we've got Inti first. And Inti was wearing a dress made of ties. She got like, how do you say, like tassels in her hair, and like baby hairs like all around her face. Her face is stunning. The dress is very, very simple. And we've seen this before. We just saw it last week in Drag Race Down Under. But, um, I think she is such, she understands the runway and she understands how to walk the runway because of her ballroom experience and her face is gorgeous. So the dress may not be as polished and actually on all her social media, he did, she, they didn't put a picture of her, their look on the runway. They put like a better version of it. So I think she looks gorgeous. Inti was safe. Okay, so after Inti, we have Arancha Castilla La Mancha that made her outfit like this collar blocking uh, skirt and top. She's like cleaning everything. She's got this bubble gun and she's like wiping everything uh, because she made her outfit with cleaning cloth. Uh, I think she looks cute, but very simple and her figure doesn't look correct she looks like a square i don't like that but she was serving it so okay arancha okay we don't expect arancha to be the most polished femme queen either she said that she doesn't tuck which i think is 100 percent okay uh and that's her style so simple is not bad and okay okay and after Arancha, we have Ugaceo Crujiente that made this dress that had like mop fibers on her fingers and on the skirt. And she painted herself as being super sad. And it was like if she was mopping her tears. They are a very conceptual queen, so they look like so cool. <laughs> they look so cool. They have their own concept they always paint this way and i love it because it's not femme presenting makeup it's not mask presenting makeup it's just like fantasy presenting makeup and i love it very much they have this huge artistic concept of someone that's so sad they have to like mop their tears i think it's so cute so cute so cute then we have killer queen the one that was sewing so fast on the runway and she has this full uh, huge garment. She says it's like uh, Marie Antoinette. 
but it's not giving me Marie Antoinette. It's just giving me a huge ballroom dress with all these flowers. And yeah, they look very, very cool. The color combination is very cool. She always says like uh, in her style, in her style, more is more. So you're not going to see a lot of uh, minimalism editing from Killer Queen. She's going to be very over the top and very more is more kind of gal. And we love it for we love them for that. <laughs> then we have Sagittaria. Sagittarius look looked like this. It reminded me very much of Aquaria in the ball when she had this cute like black bolt. Or, you know, she was wearing nothing basically, but a huge bolt. But the way you style it, the way it's of course it's not a garment. She didn't sew anything on that. But she has a very good understanding of what she wants to give. The hair, I think, complements it perfectly. It's kind of like this Jetson 60s thing that is so cool with the whole outfit. And yeah, she was looking fabulous. Fabulous. Then we have the Macarena. And I didn't think her garment was so bad from like waist up. I loved it. But it wasn't finished and the little they had a little paper stapled into they didn't see that it's just like how and it wasn't finished but I didn't think the look was so bad I think it was cool I think the thing she had on her shoulder was like a flamingo and flamingo in Spanish is said flamenco and because of the all these like flamenco dresses and songs and everything um, I think it was like kind of punny and not a lot of people are getting that. Uh, it may be a swan, it may be a swan, but it's pink, girl, a pink swan, looks like a flamingo, I don't know, it's set, you know, flamenco de Macarena, it makes sense. And, but yeah, I, I'm very sad because I really love this queen. I really, really, really love her. And then we have Dobima Nurmi. Dobima Nurmi is wearing a water hose. That's all she's wearing, okay. I think that she understands fashion. She understands what she's doing. She's, she understands what she's giving. I just think she's on, she's used to maybe photo shoots and not walking down a runway or performing. This was not very good. I think she can do better. I'm not very sure about like the hair. I don't know what was wrong about it. I don't know, but it was wrong. She didn't do anything. She just tied a water hose around her body to give this BDSM thing and she had like mesh and that's basically it so yeah she couldn't walk down the runway because her heels were getting stuck in this mesh webby thing so she couldn't even walk down the runway not nice then we have Poopy Poison. Poopy Poison looked an absolute mess and we are here for it. A lot of people don't understand why Poopy Poison wasn't uh, lip syncing and that's because she didn't look like that bad. I don't understand why she puts like bulky things in her waist to make her look like, I don't know, why do you put like a bulky belt? In her figure was not looking fine. Her taste level is very questionable. We don't mind a questionable taste in Poopy Poison because she's very known for her questionable taste and we live for it. She was selling it out the runway. She had this huge like brush thingy and she was cleaning and doing stupid things and she served it. Like her look was trash. Yes, it was, but I don't know, maybe we're not being objective with her, but you know what, like, fuck being objective. <laughs> we just love her very much. And then we have Carmen Farala. Carmen Farala made this very complete garment. She looked stunning. She, she's a great, great seamstress. She knows her body. She knows how to be hyper feminine. And I think she did a great, she did a great job with this look. I saw that she had a couple of threads. If if you look when they show like their feet, you can see there were it wasn't finished because there were like some threads coming under. Like people didn't clock that. I don't know. But yeah, she looked like amazing. Like you cannot say too many negative things about Carmen Farala in this dress. 
And then we have Drag Vulcano. As you can see, Drag Vulcano's aesthetic is going to be very similar all the time. You're going to see a bodysuit, some high boots with the big platform things and all the face and shoulders and arms, okay? Because that's the kind of outfits they perform in down there in the Canary Island. So she's being, uh, she's giving her usual look. I think she looks very good. I'm living for the huge ponytail thing. I think she was looking cute. Yeah, so that was the runway. Uh, you didn't miss much uh, with the judges in the runways and in the critiques uh, because they are just as cringy, awkward, punny critiques as they have in Drag Race and any other edition. I think it's okay. We're used to all this cringe with the little comments down the runway. They're never funny, never. But it's okay. All the dad jokes in the world, everything. Yeah, that was the episode. The bottom three were The Poison, The Macarena, and Dovima Nurmi. I think it was a well-deserved bottom three. I did think that Poopy Poison was going to be in the bottom two, and I did think she was going to be eliminated just because that's exactly what happened in the UK version with Joe Black being a very well-respected queen and going home in the first episode. So that was going to, that was 100% what was going to happen. Now I understand that for the judges, the most important thing was how you sell the outfit and it was not so much the outfit in itself. So Poopy did a better job than Dovima like a thousand times. Dovima looked a lot better though. So that's the T. The tops were um, Ugaceo Crujiente, Sagitaria, and Carmen Parala. It was very funny because when they were going to say who won the episode, first they called out Carmen Parala and she totally, totally thought she was going to win it. Totally. And she was like so gooped. It was like a little face crack, but you could only see it like inside of her. We all thought she was going to win since, I don't know, they said their name first. But then they say, oh, you're safe. And she was like, face crack. <laughs> and then they say they don't want her to win like the mini challenge and the maxi challenge that are too many crowns for one head, for one episode, whatever, Carmen. <laughs> Ugaceo won. I think it was well-deserved. I didn't like very much how their headpiece was in the back but well that's like all the critiques i have i think it was a very conceptual smart look it wasn't that difficult to make but it was very effective in the story they wanted to tell so gato crujiente the winner for the first episode of grupo's drag race very well deserved the people going to the lip sync uh were dovi manurmi and the macarena and we were all gagged that poopy was safe but we were like okay with it because though Ima was kind of being, being kind of problematic a little bit, I don't know. And the Macarena, the Ma we we're also sad when we saw the Macarena in the bottom two. And I think everyone was rooting for the Macarena, not to shade though Ima, but I don't think it, you can get how charismatic the Macarena is in Spanish. If you spoke Spanish, and you understood all of the jokes, you would fall in love with the Macarena. What can I say about the lip sync? So uh, the lip sync were the Macarena with Dovima Nurmi. And first of all, I'm going to leave the song down in the comments as well, because that is such a huge queer anthem here in Spain. If you don't know Monica Naranjo, you should. <laughs> it's like maybe like a Mariah Carey but from Spain her vocals are just amazing and she's such an icon for the LGBT community here in Spain and she has been forever and this song which is called Sobreviviré it means I will survive and it has been this huge queer anthem in Spain for many many years we love Monica Naranjo here please go check her out because the song is fire and you should follow Monica Naranjo everywhere because she is the coolest bitch ever. And the lip sync. We were all rooting for the Macarena, I think. I don't know. It's just so easy to fall in love with the Macarena. So easy. She is such a cutie. I don't think you can understand how 
charismatic and funny the Macarena is if you don't speak Spanish, but she is like the coolest Andaluz person that you can ever meet. And we were all kind of like rooting for her, but her wig flew off and then she lost it. She just, she, I think she was nervous. She thought she was going home and she got all this energy that couldn't like focus into anything. Dovima did this performance that was very increchendo. Uh, so I think that the song was increchendo as well. You really have to listen to that song. The song was very increchendo, so she matched the energy of the song a little bit better. But honestly, I was so bored, so bored looking at Dovima. I didn't think she should have won. And it, I'm not objective. I just basically love the Macarena. But the Macarena went home and Dovima was safe. I think no one expected from that runway the Macarena to go home, but well, it was deserved for the Vima, whatever. I just think that it's given me a vibe very much like Miss Vanji with the first elimination, where it's someone that has such a huge charisma that you have to love. And she, I think she had this very, very cool perspective on drag. She would have killed any singing challenge like next week. She would have killed the snatch game or any comedy challenge. She was a very, very fierce queen. And she is very, very, very likable, very likable. She's so funny, she's so natural, she's so sweet. And she's like so honest. She spoke about a lot of very, very important things. And her interview, you're like, watch a packing that we have here. It's an interview with Anna Locking, the fashion designer from the panel of judges uh, she was like so down to earth so normal she talked about drug addiction she talked about very sensitive topics and how drag has saved her life uh, literally like quite literally and when she said goodbye she thanked everyone and then she got all flamenca Ay, que ve, hacerme venir hasta aquí, no sé. she was being like so nasty and natural which is very common and very normal in, in the south of Spain and the, our humor and the way everyone lives. And people are like that on the street, like all the time. And I live for it. Like they're so cool down here. And she was such a charismatic, honest, natural and like sweet queen. I'm very, very sad to see her go, but I know she's going to have a fabulous career. And she's going to have a fabulous career internationally, girl. If you're going to export one of these queens for any international gigs, the Macarena is the right one because she can sing, she can act, she's super funny, and she's bilingual. So I know she's going to have a great career. I think it's going to be similar to the Vanji thing. And I don't know, I, I, I love you, Macarena, with all my heart. I love you. <laughs> so that's everything for episode one. I just wanted to like help you understand a couple things that I would understand because I speak I speak Spanish and they're not 100% translatable. So that's what's going on with all the queens. And that's those are their names and that's all the tea. So if you want to see more tea about the future episodes, uh, please follow me. I leave all the links that I've talked about down below and huge queer kisses to all of you.